handled by me, or by two uh, experts on the subject of creative writing uh, at hand to provide their expertise and experiences with regard to creative writing in the professional realm as well as amateur realm. Ladies and gentlemen, learned scholars, brothers and sisters, uh, we are living in an age whereby creative writing has become extremely powerful and very, very influential. Uh, if we examine the rough definition of creative writing on Wikipedia, we discover that it is a kind of writing that is goes beyond journalistic or professional writing. Um, it may cover, for example, writing for um, you know newspapers using the narrative methodology or narrative trope to tell a very important point that you that we may find in many publications and newspapers around the world. But I think that in most cases, when people think of creative writing, they tend to associate it with uh, elements of the entertainment. And since we are living in the age of multimedia and electronic media, it has been translated into forms of movies, series, uh, and so forth and so forth. But I think that the Islamic world has been I think, slow in appreciating this very powerful medium. And as a result of uh, the Muslim remain mostly consumers of creative writing, especially by the West, many of our cultural identity, cultural legacy and heritage has been, if for lack of a better word, hijacked. As you can see, for example, in many TV series, uh, streaming programs, cinemas and things like that, and as a result, we are struggling to put our voices forward to articulate the true identity of our identity, of our heritage, our legacy, our culture, through the medium of creative writing, be it in the written form, be it in the electronic form. So what we would like to do today, tonight rather, is to invite two speakers uh, to share with us their experiences and uh, knowledge on the element of creative writing. Both speakers are very, very talented and gifted in their respective fields. Uh, both are from Malaysia. One is uh, Professor Norbarida Abimana, uh, who has under her belt 30 years of teaching, uh, literature, linguistics, and English, as well as uh, creative writing, which is her specialty. When it comes to creative writing, she examines with her students issues relating to post-colonialism writing, as well as uh, elements of, 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 of the Renaissance literature. She is very prolific as a researcher, as a writer, and as contributor to issues relating to uh, women, Islamic society in general, and contemporary issues. Uh, our second panel, uh, our sec second speaker tonight, or other panel member, is Professor Rahma uh, Ahmad H. Osman, um, who uh, is an expert in Malay and Arabic literature. She is extremely prolific in her publication work. Uh, she has taught many, uh, you know, courses and written many papers and and, and published materials on uh, Islam. Uh, Islamic literature and Malay literature. And I think that we have selected two highly qualified people who share with us their, uh, 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 their knowledge and their uh, analysis of the current state of creative writing in the Muslim world. But I think that it, it would be a disservice if we ignore uh, in discussing about creative writing issues relating to politics, economics, cultural and religion. And I think that in many cases, when, when we read a piece of creative writing, whether in published mode or in electronic mode, I think that both mediums have become really powerful in shaping uh, the perception and the, and, and the views of the Muslim people. No doubt, we've been informed by many researchers and scholars that uh, Islam or Muslim is, uh, are, is the largest um, group of uh, people uh, in the world in terms of conversion and subscription. But I think that we are not capitalizing on the 
number strength. We might have a huge number, but I think that we have not yet fully capitalized on these numbers as a strength. And I think that more so in the creative aspect. Nonetheless, uh, there are signs of changing trend. For example, if we Google on, on, uh, on uh, Google search, uh, uh, under the category of women, mus women, sorry, Muslim writers in the 21st century relating to creative writing, names like Hafsa Faisal, Hen Hagasi, Hana Alkaf comes to mind. Uh, these are young writers who live all over the world, in Egypt, in the US, in Malaysia, and many others who have done a tremendous job in articulating the Muslim ideals, the Muslim views uh, uh, in, in relation or in, in, on the platform of creative writing, whether that writing is uh, fantasy, uh, you know, adventure, and so forth, uh, is, is, uh, is very obvious to see. But I think that the number is not sufficient. At the same time, the number of Muslims who continue to enjoy and appreciate creative writing through novels and, for example, through poetry is also rising. And I think even the fact that due to uh, migration to the Western countries, for example, more and more young people are getting educated, like in Malaysia and Singapore, Indonesia, and many other places in the, in the Gulf, for example, uh, these have opened the minds of the young that one can become a true Muslim believer and at the same time enjoy uh, the creative aspect of writing. Unfortunately, writing that uh, speaks, that articulates the Muslim uh, perspectives on many issues, on politics, on morality, on culture, on, on, on society, I think is, uh, is not developing fast enough. And I, when we hope that, or rather I hope that tonight by inviting Professor Nofarida and Professor Rahma they could provide us with insights based on your research. Uh, what is the true picture uh, of creative writing in the Muslim world and how it could serve to uh, articulate uh, the ideals of the Islamic society? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think uh, I have said enough as introductory remarks, and it is best that we invite uh, the two panel members to deliver their uh, uh, insights, to share with us their experiences on the, ex on the subject of creative writing and how they could become instrumental in helping to build a uh, productive and uh, pr uh, useful ummah, right? Without further ado, I'll begin with uh, Professor Nur Farida, later on from Rahma. Uh, may I remind both speakers that uh, each of you has uh, have about 30 minutes to articulate your views and to be followed by a bit of summary uh, by me and someone to translate into Arabic to be followed by Q&A. Without further ado, uh, with great honor, I'd like to invite Prof. Nur Farida to deliver her views. Thank you, uh, Brother Maslan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman Chi. Yeah, as the convener of this webinar and also my esteemed colleague, uh, Prof. Rahma and everybody else here, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. I think I will share with you my uh, PowerPoint. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Um, let me, you can see it now, right? Can we put in full display, Professor? Good job, good job. <laughs> How, uh? Uh, you click a, a okay can you can you see it now e, yeah but in, in working mode huh yes in we can working mode, okay. yeah working mode but not in display mode i should have like i've lost control of it huh? <laughs> never mind Let, let's go back let's let, let's come back to the working mode. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I think I would just have to speak as it is because you know I'm having problem with controlling the uh, okay. my no screen since beginning. Yeah. But yeah. I think I would just read from. Luckily, I printed it out. Okay. Uh, hold on a minute. But anyway, the it's still on working mode now. Eh? No, nothing on the screen. Nothing on the screen. Yeah. 
I will just stop there. We'll, we'll try again. Okay. We'll try again. Mm -hmm. Share. Maybe you can share your slides with Brother Mazlan. Oh. Yeah, there, there's no time to do that. I'll do that later. Right. I think um, we, we won't have time. I mean, I always get this problem somehow. <laughs> but anyway, um, we will start with focus of the talk. Yeah, the objective of the talk is to discuss the importance of creative writing and reading culture. I tie that together, creative writing and reading culture. And I would like us to think about why this is important. You know, I like to point out that no civilization was built without culture. And by that, we include, you know, for tonight's purpose, by culture, we mean great artwork, beautiful written, beautiful spoken language, more so written work for tonight. So why creative writing? You know, this will be the backbone of our discussion. Why is there the need for a reading culture? Reading culture is bigger than reading habit. A reading habit is just habit, you know. Sometimes it's in, sometimes it's out, but culture is there to stay. So I, I, if you notice in my topic, I stress on the word reading culture. But I think it's very important to define what creative writing means. But creative writing as we know today, whether you are in the Muslim world or whether out there in the Western world, it is still based within the parameter or the uh, framework of Western academic tradition. When we say creative writing, then we think about form. We think about the genres and categories. Yeah? Very often, it is seen as a skill to help one expresses oneself, to capture the complexity of life in writing. Now, as an academic program, uh, we, we look at it as having uh, various form and genres from um, from from poetry to fiction yeah and by fiction i mean novel and short story yeah scripts you can hear me well yeah because i just got a complaint that i'm not yeah. loud enough can you hear no no yeah, yeah very clear okay good um so you know you you also mean uh, we also include script screenplays creative non-fiction usually people don't think about this people talk about fiction only but in creative writing we also mean creative non-fiction by that we mean memoir yeah literary journalism travel writing diary food writing personal essays and so on and so forth so it's that as well it's included in creative writing now Creative writing, as we understand in the um, Western framework, you will need more critical skill than it being reflective writing. I think this is probably where we might differ. Yeah, uh, We'll go into that later on. Now, the artistic expression is usually drawn on imagination. Yeah, This is the Western framework. This is used to communicate meaning through use of other literary devices or use of drama or use of narrative. In the Western concept of creative writing, there is no right or wrong. There's no limit. That's why, you know, if you attend creative writing, if you feel like you want to come out as a gay, as a lesbian, they will encourage this you feel like you want to talk about you wanting to commit, commit, commit suicide, go ahead. No right and wrong. Yeah. But I've been teaching Islamic uh, creative writing at IIUM. You know, I developed the coursework and all that. And through the years, I find that there must be a limit. As Muslims writing, as Muslim producing work to inspire or to influence, uh, to, to be read by other people, Definitely there be, there need to be a limit. There must be a sense of right and wrong. Yeah, but if you talk like this in the West, they will say literature, creative writing should not be a domestic uh, exercise, should not be sermon, should, should be devoid of religion and so on, yeah? religious values and whatnot. Yeah. So I think these are the things that we need to be clear about. So in trying to come up with Islamic framework, 
I would like to have something like Islamic creative writing. So in trying to develop that, I would start with the definition given to Islamic literature. After all, the output of your creative writing, your Islamic creative writing, will be in the end be Islamic literature. So it's it's best for you to uh, to understand what Islamic literature is. Yeah, we are fortunate because over the years there have been a lot of Muslim scholars, you know, uh, thinking about this, writing about this, both in Malaysia and outside. And I would like to quote the work of some of our young colleagues from Malaysia, Asma Muhammad Yusuf and our own Nusafira Ahmad Safian, who wrote a paper, uh, I think last year, last year, 2019, here in uh, Journal Sultan Alauddin Sulaiman Shah on concept of Islamic literature uh, in Muhammad Kutub and Muhammad Osman El Muhammadi. One is an Egyptian writer, the other Malaysian. Yeah, so they, they started with looking at the root word al adab yeah, which in which was initially associated with I don't know Arabic, I'm just quoting them. Yeah? Perhaps our friends in Arabic can correct me later on if I'm wrong or if I'm reading it uh, wrongly. But they started with the term al adab which was initially associated with ethics, moral, good behavior, good relations with one another. And very often, this word is tied up to the invitation to eating and drinking. So now, you know, when I read that, I said, aha, now I understand. The Muslim hospitality, whether you are in Saudi, in Malaysia, you know, the adab is the, the adab is to invite guests to your house, feed them, give them food and drinking. You know, it makes sense. It's beautiful, yeah? Um, uh, later, that would evolve to include forms of writing and speaking, which include prose, uh, poetry, oratory, letter writing. So Islamic literature, yeah, from this writing, they argued that it came with Islamic reform. If you understand Islamic reform came because we understood, we have been colonized for so long, we lost our Muslim identity. Yeah, so the Islamic reform came with Sayyid Kutub, yeah, leading member of Egyptian Muslim uh, Brotherhood, himself a scholar, himself a poet, himself a writer. And, um, you know, it started with that, you know, this awareness that you need to take charge of your own culture, your own literary heritage. Yeah. Uh, and in Malaysia, yeah, as argued by the two young scholars, they pointed out that Islamic framework was popularized by Shannon with his Islamic uh, lit literature theory, Theory Sastra Islam. Do we have any non-Malaysians in this crowd? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I will use the Malay equivalent. I think there are a couple. There, there are quite a number of non-Malaysians. Yes. Non okay. yeah. All right. All right. So um, then you've got these are Malaysians, uh, Malaysian writers, M Malaysian intellectuals who have been looking at the concept and definition of Islamic literature. Then you've got Mama Effendi Hassan with his Pesuratan Melayu Baru. You've got Shafi'i Abu Bakar with his Theory Takmila. You've got Najib Alatas with Faham Sastra Islami. You've got Syed Osman, Syed Omar with Kritika Melayu, Hashim Awang, Awang with Peng Kaedahan Melayu, our own Professor Kamal Hassan with Gagasan Sastra Islam. You know, many people do not un, uh, do not know much about Prof Kamal being a literary person. You know, he's a poet and he has written a lot on uh, Sastra Islam as well, yeah? And then you've got, of course, the late uh, Usman El Muhammadi with his Gagasan Sastra Melayu Islami. So our sisters, uh, Dr. Asma and Safira, compared, yeah, in their article, they compared the two, Muhammad Kutub and also uh, Usman El Mahadi. And I find that, I know you, if you take their definition and you try to apply to what I've been doing, I'm not that far off, you know, of the, 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 the intention of coming up with something pure and good 
and you know applicable to how uh, Islamic literature at least defined by some of these great scholars. Now it's a starting point anyway. I mean you can choose from the the, the series of writers I mentioned earlier. I'm just you know looking at how applicable El Muhammadi and Muhammad Kuto is if I were to apply it to my text in class. <coughs> but the question remains why is islamic creative writing important why do we need it you know it used it's coming back it's trending now whether in the west or in malaysia people would rather do creative writing than literature per se yeah but uh, you need both although i enjoy doing creative writing because it gives that freedom to you to create something and to shape you know where you want to go now for me, Islamic creative writing is important for us to keep our writers on track. That it's 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 a it's a guide. It's a guidance. It should be used as a yardstick, you know, as a mold, so that you do not lose sight of mission, why they write, to what end, to what purpose. It is important to understand the mission of life. This is equivalent to understanding the mission of life, purpose of existence, so that, you know, when we write, we write with great intention, with great purpose. Uh, Kutub, Muhammad Kutub stresses a lot on emotion and the feeling, not just the importance of ideas or philosophy. In the West, for example, you know, the art is important, the content is important, but rarely people talk about emotion. Emotion. When you are acting, yes, you know, when you want to express yourself in that sense, they say, okay, you know, make sure emotion is there. But for Kuto, you know, that's the starting point. If you don't start with emotion or feeling, then what you write is not genuine. So he stresses on that. Now, and this art, it, this art must connect to nature, mankind. They must connect to the creator. You know, we talk about the three, uh, the three triangle, you know, uh, nature, mankind, Allah. They all must connect. And when they connect, it must be you know, to the mold of Quran as source of reference, Quran and Hadith. That is your mode. You cannot run away from this. Otherwise, it's not Islamic literature. It's not Islamic creative writing if you don't have this kind of reference. Al Muhammadi, on the other hand, stresses on the purification of the heart, of the mind, especially of the material, material world of nafs. You know, you cannot produce something good if yourself is not good this is what he's saying if your heart is not pure if your mind is not pure how can you produce something pure otherwise it'd be like hypocrisy yeah you you would tell people but you don't walk the talk that kind of thing so he would not have anything like this he said you must have purification of the heart and you must have sincerity your prof kamal also stress on this in his gagasan yeah? uh, sincerity taqwa you must have close relationship with allah you must be able to inspire your readers why do you write a lot of people write for shots and diri you know they just want self-glorification ask any young writers if they don't have that awareness of writing for allah because of allah they write for win glory. I want to see myself in print. I want to see myself published. I want to be famous. I want to make money. You know, but you write to inspire people. You write as El Muhammadi said in Malay. I love this because if I say in Malay that understanding is so apt. I try to uh, translate it in English. And in Malay, he says, Mampu membangunkan jiwa-jiwa yang tandus. How do you translate that, Brother Mazlan? Mampu membangunkan jiwa-jiwa yang tandus. Tandus, how do you translate? Revive the, the spiritually dead. Huh? 
spiritually <laughs> yeah. dead. Spiritually, spiritually dead. You yeah. must bring back to life. You must evoke. Yeah. You must bring back to life. Uh, soulless or dead soul. Apa tadi juga? Spiritually dead. Spiritually people. dead. Yeah. But the rest of you who understand Malay, I think you understand this. Mampu membangunkan jiwa-jiwa yang tandus. I will share with you an experience I had reading a Sufi literature by Farid Udin Attar. And I wasn't the, the only one. I thought I was the only one. But my panel from Lebanon who was sharing the panel was doing the same text. When I told him, when I was reading Farid Udin, uh, Farid, um, Monte Kotair, Parliament of Birds by Fariuddin Attar, for two weeks, I was in this fana world. The rest of the world, I felt nothing. I, just blank, blank, you know? And my soul was like cringing, crying, but no tears. So, you know, the impact of Sufi literature on me, and, and I was talking about this, and this guy, he said, you know, I went through the same thing. I went through the same thing. So sometimes good literature will poke your soul until your soul is awakened. Jiwa yang tandus tadi. It is real. Membangunkan jiwa tandus itu adalah sesuatu yang baru. Adalah sesuatu yang benar. I experience it. My friend, the late uh, Daniel Abdul Hayr, an American poet who converted to Islam, he's a Sufi follower. You know, I was doing a research on him when I was a Fulbright, spoke with him, spent time with him, went to his Sufi group. And, and you know, he told me that when he visited Maulana Rumi's tomb, he came back, he was so inspired, I just, just like that. And he wrote Ghazal nonstop, nonstop, day in, day out, day, day in, day out, until he reached Son, the Ghazal 99. When he reached Gaza 99, then only was he able to stop. 99 names of Allah equivalent. So, you know, it's real. It's real. If you go deep into that, you know, your connection with Allah and so on, the writing will take control. The writing will have its own life. All right? Now, uh, El Muhammadi somehow stresses on the traditional form. You have to keep to the traditional form. Some people will be a bit more creative and say, no, no, no. Uh, Gaza, we want to change form. This, we want to change form. But he said, no. Islamic literature is in this form. It has to be in that form. But the message can be universal. Right? So this faith-based or Islamic uh, creative writing, I think, you know, it is very important that we understand first the definition, what, what, the framework, the framework must be there before we write and say, this is Islamic writing. It must have that mode. Yeah, like if in the West, you've got theoretical framework. How do you wish to read your text? You use this mode, this theoretical framework. Or you want to write as a post -Marx, as a Marxist writer. You want to write as a feminist writer. So you must have those elements when you write. You know, you have to free, uh, marginalize women, talk about poor women, blah, blah, blah. Then only could you say, hey, this is feminist writing because you follow the rules. And, um, and I think, you know, creative writing, Islamic creative writing has to be purposeful. It has to be using, as I said, Quran and Sunnah as the ultimate guidance in molding our creativity. It has to be that. Right? If so, if you don't agree, call it something else. But I'm saying if you want, if you're interested in this kind of framework, those are the rules and regulation that I would recommend. Now, the final destination, of course, yeah, is to enlighten, inspire our readers to be good people, good servants of Allah, beneficial to other things, and so on. It should be able to offer hope to the hopeless, joy to the joyless, and I think most of the definition makers of Islamic literature would also stress on the importance of aestheticism, the beauty. Lo God loves beauty, therefore your writing should also be that, you know, in terms of language, in terms of uh, content, 
you know, good values, beautiful values. Again, you know, I keep asking why is Islamic creative writing important? The next question is for whom? Important to whom? Important because we are in this context eh, of um, being Muslim audience, definitely Muslims, especially young Muslims. Why? In a world which is becoming more lonely and isolating, where people communicate more through writing than talking, do you notice that the young one do not know how to communicate verbally anymore? I mean, I have trouble with my younger nieces. They don't know how to talk. Yeah, they do know how to communicate or to express ideas. Even in texting, when you, you tell them the story, they will just come with one liner. Nice, cool, interesting. You know, for me, this is very, very worrying. Yeah, we need to teach our young ones to express themselves in healthy manner, intelligently. Yeah, in doing so, it will help them understand themselves better. Yeah, otherwise they were just using others as their role model. You know, they, they, they are on internet a lot and one friend will say, oh, look, I'm going to commit myself. Look, I'm brave. And then it becomes a challenge for everybody and everybody is using this. You start yeah, imitating. It happens. It happens to my kids' neighborhood. Where do they learn? From friends online. They challenge each other. And then the next time you know, they've got wrist, uh, mark yeah, on their wrist following friends, yeah? And parents are too busy to teach them that this is wrong. So I think by engaging them in writing, in reading, they will be able to learn, yeah? Uh, writing is also a therapy. All pent up negative emotions can be unleashed through creative writing where they can escape into a world, which isn't like perhaps the hell they may live in. You know, for a young children living today is very hard. You know, just looking around you, you, you may be able to empathize how different it is growing up today and say 50 years ago. <laughs> that's a long time to compare with, right? But that's one generation. This generation and the last generation, the way we grow up is not the same. I think it's much more difficult today. Yeah? And that's why I think we need to engage the young ones as early as possible to be able to express themselves, share their feelings, creativity. Yeah. It is also very important to have a well-trained Islamic creative writing teacher to play his or her role in guiding the young writers. They encourage the young ones to read, think critically, allow themselves to express whatever they wish yeah, after giving the guideline and without impinging on artistic and creative form and expression. Now, I find there is a correlation between creative writing and reading habit. And, um, you know, there is a, a program which ran successfully in Morocco. The literacy rate in Morocco is very poor, especially for children under 15 years. That goes everywhere, even in Malaysia. UNESCO uh, statistics says that children below 15, the literacy rate is very poor. Even in Malaysia, although our literacy rate is good for adults, 80, you know, close to 90, but if you check literacy below 15, it's about 30%. And what more with pandemic, you know, after pandemic where we have lost quite number, they were saying we would be two years behind or how many years behind because of this pandemic, it will be worse, right? But in Morocco, there is a special reading program that proved to be uh, doing successfully, that, was, that went successfully using phenomic awareness where students learn as young as four or five years old, learn to create stories based on the sound of the alphabet. I think in Arabic, it, it may work very well because the sound, you know, and in, uh, I've yet to see, I've yet to explore this further because I just got to know about this while doing research for this webinar. It is something that I want to go back and revisit and perhaps, you know, this is something I would like to engage in for my retirement. You know, in two years, probably this is what I want to do, work with young children to help them to read, to write below 15. Yeah, it's something that I would like to explore. Now, this phenomic awareness is used as a foundation to teach reading and writing among young people. 
we have to acknowledge this. We have to recognize this as an issue. To have a strong reading culture is vital for any nation to develop and to prosper. We have to do. I mean, we talk about the need of reading, reading, reading. But what do we do about it? Very little. But if we recognize it as an urgent need, especially for the Ummah, we have to mobilize the young ones, especially, to read. The older one at university as well. You guys need to read beyond your textbook. Time? Okay. Four minutes. Huh? Four minutes. Okay, I think I'll be able to do that. So, you know, a quick look around uh, the world where in countries dominantly populated by Muslim do not give a good impression. UAE, Malaysia, Turkey, Morocco, all bad news. Students don't read, they don't like to read. PISA results is very poor. You know, there is a correlation, a study done by Turkish um, scientists, Turkish biologists, Azu Ornel and Sule Firat Dur Durbukoka, saw the correlation between reading habit and achievement of high school students studying biology. It showed that half of Turkish students were not science literate, one third did not know how to read at all. Reading habit in UAE, U Dubai, very sophisticated. Organizers knowledge summit yearly and in 2016 found that less than 15% of first grade students were likely to graduate from high school. Reading was limited to textbooks and memorization. Not that I'm against memorization. The recent studies have shown that memorization may be one way yeah, to trigger off your button up there, your intelligence button. But overdoing it would be bad. Yeah, A lot could have taken place since 2016. I don't know. I hope somebody from UAE may want to come back and say, you're wrong. That's, that's obsolete. Now this is the reading. But if nothing has been changed since then, I would say, yeah, UAE's wealth will not be able to sustain itself if all talent are not replaced by young local talent. In the end, your country will be run by others. I think it's already run by others. Yeah, but this may be quite a pony. Why? So I think I think I would I would leave I would uh, sum up I would um, I would leave you with the following question questions that I wish you to consider. What are our roles as teachers and writers to move creative writing and reading culture in our localities? We keep saying students don't read, students don't read. But have we asked them why they don't read? Have we asked them if, have we, have we asked ourselves if we have written interesting books ourselves, translated great books for our students to read from, and so on and so forth? How do we instill love for knowledge, encourage creative writing for the sake of Allah? So I think I leave these questions and I hope we'll be able to, to um, you know, discuss it further in Q&A. Thank you, Brother Masan. Right. Thank you, Professor Nasarida. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, with that, I would like to invite Professor Rahma to deliver her views on the subject of Islamic creative writing. Tafadal, Professor. Just bear with me. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin ash-shafir mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Rabbi Shrah Lee Sadri Wa Yisili Amri Wahlu Al-Uqdatan Milisani Yafqa Wa Qawli Thank you first and foremost to uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Rahman Chi our Ustaz and our Guru um, for years uh, I am honoured uh, to, to be sharing uh, in this uh, session um, and uh, the Rabiat al Adab al Islami and my esteemed uh, colleague uh, 
and my senior professor, Dr. Nur Farida Abdul Mana. It was really a, a, a enlightening uh, sharing session that you have just delivered, Prof. Um, okay. I am uh, not sure what is going on uh, with the internet now. It was all okay. Now I am blurred. Uh, and I'm not sure whether I need to leave and then re enter. Uh, can you do fine, Doctor? Uh, no, you can see me fine. I can't see anything. Uh, I will help you with the PowerPoint slide. I will, I will uh, open up from my side. Uh, no, no. Can I just uh, uh, leave and enter? Um, you could try, but I'm sure whether you can come in or not. You, could, you can try it. You can try, yes. Yeah, yeah. Exit and come back. Okay, while waiting for Prof. Rahma to sort out uh, the technical situation from her side allow me to uh, uh to recap some of the points that which were made earlier by professor north Arida with regard to the uh, uh what makes or what constitutes uh islamic creative writing uh, she talked about islamic creative writing as being an extremely powerful platform to uh to articulate Muslim ideas and Muslim perspectives on life. Uh, she also highlighted uh, it is not uh, uh, a unique idea to employ creative writing uh, to promote uh, reading culture among Muslim youth. Uh, in particular, Professor Nur Farida uh, uh, you know, uh, referred to uh, her favorite Sufi literature, especially Sufi literature, uh, which has, which have done a tremendous job in uh, encapsulating Muslim ideals uh, in the in the form of creative arts, that is through language, poetry, and whatnot. She mentioned that other than Sufi literature, like Sufi poetry, she also mentioned many uh, literary writers in the Islamic, in the Malay speaking world who have done a similar job talking about this is an untapped uh, resource for uh, Islamic ideals to reach out to young Muslims who are struggling with uh, reading materials or texts which are highly secular in nature. Uh, she mentioned Shahnun Ahmad being the most famous and many others. Uh, on that point, I would like to also add on. Okay, for Rama, can are you ready? Okay, I can see Prof. Rama is has come on, has come back. Prof. Rama, can you hear me? Nothing. Anytime you're ready, just jump in. Yeah, I, I, I'm filling in the, the time. Uh, if, if I may add, with, with, with the point which were made by Professor Nofarida earlier, I, I think that another. Can you hear me? Oh uh, yes, I can hear you now, Prof. Rama. Carry on. Okay. Proceed. Okay. Um, Subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alam tana inna kanta al-alimul hakim wa bishrah li sari wa isa li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yabqaw kawli Before I begin, I would like to uh, uh, make a disclaimer A'udhu billah minash shaitan rajim bismillahirrahmanirrahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu lima taquluna ma la taf'alun kabura maktan inda Allahi an taquluna ma la taf'alun taf so I am scared that what I'm going to say, uh, this topic, I myself do not write creative writing unlike Prof. Nur Farida. So, uh, and I'm propagating cre uh, creative writing. So I am not uh, any, um, the best amongst you to be talking on the topic, but I take the challenge and uh, I uh, welcome, I, I, I would like to contribute on the topic and uh, take this opportunity to learn further. Uh, brothers and sisters, um, I, I begin with 
this hadith by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Khairun nasi anfa'hum lin nas." You can see my slides, right? Yes, we can. So, Islam emphasizes the objective of any act. Accordingly, all our endeavors, including creative writing, should embark from a noble objective or a noble act or cause. Islam does not subscribe to the arts for arts sake ideology and slogan, hence literature or any work of art or any work in that sense. As, and especially when we talk about literature, it should be to uplift the humanity of humans and to expand the human faculty. Hence, it is the tasawwur ra'isi which differentiates between Islam and the other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah says, وَلَا تَتَّخِذُ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ huzwa." So, in Islam, we are taught not to take any revelation, any of Allah's revelations and signs lightly. Now, we come to the topic of creative writing and how the previous scholars of Islam applied it in, is, in disseminating knowledge. Writing, as we know, is, is an effective way of communicating and disseminating messages, ideas, opinions, and thoughts to people. And from time immemorial, writing has been an effective way of communicating and disseminating message, ideas, opinions, and thoughts to people. Writers tries to persuade audience towards an idea, convinces them by appealing to their senses, arousing their emotion, elucidating facts and figures, utilizing captivating language styles and liter literary tropes. Writing ranges from formal to informal, and both have its own styles formats, procedures, and rules. Format writing, formal writing requires writers to strictly follow the rules. Professionalism, standard language, proper structure, presentation of facts and figures, originality and adequate citation are essential features of formal writing. Academic writing, business writing, newspaper column, and formal letter fall under the category of formal writing. Informal writing, however, is a little bit relaxed, friendly, and casual, and the writer therein freely expresses opinions, persuades readers, and maintains personal voice. These types of writing stems from the writer's creativity and personal thought. Creative writing is the most paramount aspect of informal writing, which is the focus of this discourse. Now, we come to what is creative writing, any writing which does not fall under academic, journalistic, journalistic, professional, or technical forms of writing is considered as uh, creative writing. The writers are not subjected to stringent rules, rather freely utilize cognitive skills to unravel the world around him, discover ideas, and systematically put them into a meaningful write-up or a book. Scholars have differed, although though, um, in the definition of whether it is uh, a creative writing is, is an art or a craft. Now, however, it can be categori categorically stated that creative writing is both art and craft. It refers to any original composition that relies on imagination and written for the purpose of entertaining the reader while teaching a virtue or mirroring an aspect of human life. It is a piece of writing that is written in a way that is not academic or technical, but still attracts an audience. It is considered as an art because it is a self-expression of the writer and the originality stems from him. Creative writing starts when the writer observes the world around him, uses his imagination, reinvents the memories, explores logical way to express the idea to the readers. Writer thus shares his opinions, thoughts, ideas, feelings, philosophy, and perspective to the people in a logical or creative manner. Creative writer 
also uses his creative talents associated with language drops, such as similes, sensory imaginary, personification, and other literary figures to drive the idea. Hence, creative writing is also a craft in the sense that writer must learn the rules, guidelines, and techniques of writing. And a writer needs to study the rules of grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Creative writing entails poem, short story, and personal essay. Each of these genres has different techniques. Writer must therefore master all these before delving into the writing. Creative writing is not premised on writing on facts. Writer, however, through poetics and storytelling, needs to showcase his creativity by ensuring that his writing serves as a source of knowledge, entertainment, revelation of truth about humanity, humanity etc. Now we come to this question. If that, having known that, now how did the past Muslims use past scholars, prominent scholars, used creative writing to disseminate knowledge? Creative writing is part of a productive thinking which the Al-Quran and Sunnah have always eulogized Muslims to develop. Afala tafakkaroon, afala ta'qidoon, afala tubusiroon, ulul albab and others are some of persuading words in the glorious of in the glorious Al-Quran directed towards encouraging Muslims to think critically and creatively. The Al-Quran also encourages Muslims to travel and observe so that they can think creatively. From this perspective, Muslim scholars in the past have seriously engaged in creative thinking in order to advance knowledge in all fields. Some of the creative writings have been the area of religion science, religious sciences, languages, sociology, culture, and others. The concept of qiyas or ijtihad, critical legal thinking, which are generally agreed to be the third source of sharia, is a product of creative thinking. Now let's look at Tabari and his contribution to literature or in, in the form of creative thinking. Abu Ja'far Muhammad bin Jarir Tabari is commonly known as Tabari. And he is a great Muslim scholar, as we all know, who contributed a lot to the world, to the civilization of this world. He is renowned for his contributions in the fields of philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, and literature. His major contribution uh, in, in literature includes his tafsir at-tabari itself is actually a work of art which is on the exegesis of the Quran, the way he relates to each ayah and explains it. He also published a historical chrono chronological uh, book, Tariq al-Umam al-Muluk, History of the Prophets, uh, uh, History of the Nations and Kings. In this book, At-Tabari beautifully expressed the Quran word, word by word, and explained it lexicography. And, and explained it lexicography using historical explanations. Now we look at Al Masud. Al Masud and his contributions to literature. He, Abu Hassan Ali bin Ali Al Masudi, he was born in Baghdad. He was an Arab historian and geographer. He was also a descendant of Abdullah bin Masud, a companion of the Prophet Muhammad. And one of Mas'udi's famous works was Muruj al-Dhahab wal-Ma'adin al-Jawhar. Jawahir wal-Ma'adin al-Jawahir. The Meadows of Gold and Mines of Germs, in which he combined history and scientific geography. He flourished during this time. During this time, the books such as his were relatively cheap and readily available. Furthermore, in diverse communities, there were enormous public and private libraries which assisted Al Masoudi and other scholars of his time in the attainment of literary excellence. It was reported that Al Masoudi uh, used to frequently encourage his readers to consult his other works, which were accessible to readers. Al Masoudi was a contemporary of prominent scholars like Al Azajaj ibn Duraid. Niftaway and Ibn Anbari. Al Mas'udi knew the works of Al Kindi and Al Razi, 
and was well versed in philosophy. Al Masudi also includes the history of ancient civilizations such as, as uh, Babylon, uh, Babylonians, Egyptians, Persians, Assyrians, among others, who occupied the territory where Islam subsequently expanded in his books. From creative writing, Imam Shafi'i wrote a maiden book, Al Risala. which was considered as a creative book ever written on principles of Islamic jurisprudence. The book, through the author's critical thinking, detailed the principles of Islamic matters, which later served as base for all judicial matters and legal studies. Also, Imam Shatibi wrote a book which was named Al-Muwafaqat. He creatively analyzed maqasid sharia on all religious matters in the book. This was a maiden book which no one has been able to provide before the author. Many scholars have creatively written varieties of poems known as al manzumat to make some disciplines easier for people to learn, understand, memorize, and summarize. This has advanced knowledge today because by going through all these poems, one would have covered varieties of disciplines. These kind of manzumat include Zamzam, which is a poem on Al-Quranic interpretation, Al-Warqat uh, by Imam Al-Haramain Al-Juwaini, which was written on the signs of Islamic jurisprudence. Among the list also we have Urjuz al-Tilmi'iyah fi dhikri hali ashraf al-Bariya ibn Abil Az al-Hanafi, a biography of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, written by Abu Hassan Ali ibn Ali or Ibn Abi Az, an Al-Bayquni poet, poem of signs of hadith written by Sheikh Al-Bayquni, rahimullah, and uh, which is considered as uh, the famous uh, Shihab al-Din, Dimyati commented on a poem of Imam Bayquni by saying, the poem of the knowledgeable Imam of understanding and perception, a Sheikh al Baikuni, is one of the most interesting summaries of the science of Hadith and the most eloquent of the writings upon which one takes the rigorous course upon, for it is comprised of clear yet fine expressions that overwhelms its counterparts with a grim face. The list also includes Lamit ibn al Lamia ibn al-Wardi, named as a Nasih al-Ikhwan wal-Murshida by Abu Lay, and Al-Fiyya ibn Malik, written by Muhammad ibn Abdullah ibn, ibn Malik, the poem which contains over 1,000 lines of poetry which centers around Arabic grammar, syntax, and nah. Another great scholar in the field of creative writing, which is a contemporary, is Najib Kailani. He was one of those that established solid foundations of the Islamic literature. He wrote different storybooks such as Tajribati, Adhatiya fil Qissa, Rihlati Ma'al Adab al Islami, Hawl al Masrah al Islami, Qatil al Hamza, Nurullah, Layl wa Qabdan. Rijal wa the Ab, Jadullah, Omar Yazhar fil Quds, Amali Qatil Shimal, Layali, Walayali Turkistan, among others. In expanding the Arabic language, the fictional books known as Maqamat al Hariri and Maqamat al Hamazani are, are worthy of mention here. Maqamat al Hariri was written by Abu Muhammad al Qasim ibn Ali bin Muhammad al Usman al Hariri. And Maqam al Badi and Zaman al Hamadani was written by Badi al Zaman al Hamadani, al -Hamadani who was a medieval Arab man of letters born in Hamadan, Iran. He is best known for his book, The Maqam al Badi al Zaman al Hamadani, a collection of 52 episodic stories of a rogue Abu al Fatah al Iskandari, as recounted by a narrator Isa bin, bin Hisham. These books are regarded as the great treasures in Arabic language. The authors creatively wrote different imaginative stories in order to teach Arabic vocabulary to the people. In a similar tone, the whole world benefited from the creative writing of Ibn Khaldun in, on sociology, 
His book, Al Muqaddimah, is considered as the base of sociology and the writer. Ibn Khaldun is regarded as, is regarded as the father of sociology. In his book, he creatively examines the evolution of civilization by natural causes, principles of social change, sociology of human science, transformation of societies, social structure and theories of human sciences. The book emanates from Ibn Khaldun's hard-earned experience and personal wisdom, which enabled him to write in a manner different from the way other scholars wrote in the past. He adopted and applied the method of criticism, comparison, observation, and examination to provide the framework for philosophy and sociology as a discipline. Now we come to a contemporary, Ali Ahmed Bekathir. He's another notable scholar who has succeeded in advancing Islamic knowledge, not only through poetry and narratives, but also through drama writing. He exerted all his effort to showcase and exhibit Islamic values and culture in literature. Some of the works accredited to him are Sira Shuja, Wa Aslama, Al Faris Al Jamil, and we have after that is uh, Ahmad Din Khalil with his uh, uh, book As Saif Wal Kalima, Fi Nakd Al Islam Al Muasir. And another contemporary, which is a lady, Jihad Al Rajabi, who authored Len Amuta Sudan. I will not die for nothing. And uh, her other books, her other novels, uh, Rahil, uh, As Sahra. Allow me to. to uh, pause and observe this uh, statement by Najib Kailani saluting creativity of Islamic scholars on creative writing as he says Al-Adab al-Islami ta'abirun fanniyun jamilun mu'athir nabi' min dhati mu'mina mutarjim an al-haya wal mutarjim an al-haya wal insan wal kawn wifqa al-usus al-aqaidiyya lil-muslim wa ba'ath lil-mut'a wal manfa'a ومحرك للوجدان والفكر ومحفز لاتخاذ موقف والقيام بنشاط ما. The Islamic literature is not inflexible rules or isolated pieces of writing detached from reality. It is not a discourse or a sermon overwhelmed by rules and texts, but it is valuable images decorated with what increases their beauty and greatness and make them more effective. Islamic literature is beautiful, artistic, effective expressions that are derived from the lives of real Muslims. Such expressions become genuine images of life, humanity, and universe. These images accord and complement the beliefs and principles of Muslims. They are a source of benefit and enjoyment, and they evoke the sentiment and thought and stimulate and prompt the reader to take action. Creative writing is also used by Muslims to do da'wah and defend their faith. The example of this is the effort of a writing community called Forum Linkar Pen in Hong Kong, FLPHK, which the members of this community are Indonesian workers who work in Hong Kong. The LFP, L, uh, FLPHK is a branch community of Jakarta-based FLP writing network. And the members of this community write creatively to defend and preach Islam. The members consist of students, researchers, lecturers, freelancers, housewives, professionals, teachers, labor workers, and domestic workers. They come together purposely to spread the spirit of Islam and propagate that one. One of the members of this uh, society is Raihan, who wrote in a storybook explaining the reason that forced her to end her contract with her boss. She wrote, in Chinese restaurants that serve pork, there's no way any single menu would be safe, either because of the oil or the knife or the pen. As a Muslim, I must avoid all these, but my employer just didn't get it to them. As long as you don't eat the pork, it should be fine. Indonesian creative writers in Hong Kong also use their sharpened pens to call for religious practices such as five, the five daily prayers and Islamic moral values. 
reflection of this can be seen in most of their writings. A writer was found in this uh, juncture, reminiscing on the religious practices which she missed in her country. She writes, from afar, the sound of azan was beautifully delivered, a holy call to meet the creator. My soul trembled and I was awakened. All this time, I had never answered his calls. The sound of children learning to recite the Quran took me to the past. I was one of them when I, when I was a child. Moving forward, in a nutshell, Muslims in the past have used creative writing to advance all fields of knowledge ranging from Al-Quran, Tafsir, Science of Hadith, Maqasid al-Sharia, Arabic grammar and others. Muslims have also pioneered many disciplines through their creative writing. Ibn Khaldun still remains the father of sociology and they also engage in writing scripts of the, for the theatres, which all contributed to the development of knowledge and Islam at large. Creative writing is used by current Muslims to propagate da'wah, as we witness preach Islamic values serve as an avenue to express and narrate to their life encounters, especially by those in diaspora, as in the case of Forum Linkar Plena, Hong Kong. Moving forward, we need to revive and inculcate the habit of reading and creative writing. As the verse from the Quran, the Holy Quran says, You cannot write. You cannot write if you do not read. The need to revive hence and inculcate the habit of reading and creative writing is now becoming vital and an and inevitable endeavor. Students, as mentioned by Prof. Nur Farida correctly, us as well, I must say myself, we, we lecturers, we, we are so wrapped up by, by the, the, the mechanics of uh, the daily life and finishing syllabus, etc., etc., that we do not have the luxury as to read just for the sake of reading. Students do not read just for the sake of reading and I'm, but for the sake of passing examinations. Muslims hence need to become avid readers like our former Muslim scholars. And how did they do that? by having passion in reading, reading for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking knowledge for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because creative writing stems from critical thinking. And to learn and master the rules of language and how to write effectively, you cannot be able, you will not be able to write if you do not master Nahu and Sarf, the, gram the grammar and of whatever language, the Arabic be it or English, you have to first master the rules of the language and learn to write effectively. Rise to the challenge. Ch challenge the status quo. Challenge the world order. Cultivate and encourage curiosity. Enthuse and infuse the passion for learning. Observe the universe and Allah's creations and start to document events as our previous scholars used to do. They used to observe and write, observe and write, observe and write. Life will become a better place when everyone starts to lift a book to read and start to creatively write to make a difference. And we start doing everything for the sake of pleasing our Creator and making our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, proud and strive towards deserving his shafa, emulating the previous prominent Muslim scholars who were an embodiment of the hadith Khairun Nasi and Fa'ahum Linnas. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rahma, for your input on the subject of creative writing for the benefit of the
Now, ladies and gentlemen, um, I believe um, Dr. Rahman will take a few minutes to uh, summarize some of the points uh, which have been made by uh, both panel speakers uh, in Arabic. Uh, Dr. Rahman, can Dr. you? Dr. Wan, Wan Rosli, please. Wan Rosli, sorry. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. الجلسة الأستاذ مذلان في بداية حدثه يتحدث عن حاجتنا إلى الكتابة الإبداعية هي حاجة ماسة جدا إلى حد كبير لما فيها من تأثير قوي على المجتمع إلا أن المجال في الوقت الراهن يسيطر عليها الغرب فصرنا قراء مستهلكين بدلا من أن نكون منتجين مبدعين ثم ينتقل الحديث بعد ذلك إلى البروفيسور نور فريدة عبد المناف نور فريدة عبد المناف متخصصة في الأدب الإنجليزي فبدأت حديثها عن الكتابة الإبداعية كما عرفها الغرب فهو على حد تعبيرها ال الكتابة الإبداعية عند الغرب هو التعبير الجميل الذي يمكن أن يكون في صورة الرواية والقصص وحتى في كتابة سميروهات للأفلام والدراما وفي في عين الغرب لا يوجد هناك صحيح الخطأ في الكتابة الإبداعية فالكاتب الإبداعي له حرية مطلقة بلا حدود وله أن يكتب ما يراه ويحس به ولا يسأل عما يفعل أو عما يكتب لذلك رأت المحاضرة أو رأت الفسور أنها لابد من وضع إطار إسلامي للأدب ليتناسب مع حاجتنا إلى هذا المجال الإبداعي فهنا يأتي ضروريا أن الأدب الإسلامي الأدب الإسلامي الأدب الإسلامي بالاختصار والتعريف يعني هناك التعريفات للأدب الإسلامي جاءت بها البروفيسور لكن يمكن أن نقول أن الأدب الإسلامي حسب ما توصل إليه العلماء أنه أدب يوضع لبيان تعليم الإسلام السمحة وأيضا لماذا للدعوة إلى الله سبحانه وتعالى والكتابة الإبداعية حسب نظرتها أنها تعبير عن الأحاسيس والمشاعر والعواطف ويجب أن يكون هناك ربط بين هذه العواطف والمشاعر بالطبيعة والرب لما نقول أنه نجب أن نربط هذه الأشياء بالقرآن الكريم أيضا لأنه أننا المسلمون يجب أن نرتبط بالقرآن الكريم والأحاديث النبوية ولا يمكن وأيضا هناك نقطة مهمة جدا تفضل بها المحاضرة الأولى أن الكاتب يجب أن يكون سليم القلب يكتب من من قلبه يعني لا يمكن أن يكون الكاتب يكتب عما لا يفعل يعني عما لا يستطيع أن يفعله فيجب أن يعبر بالصدق عما في نفسه بلا رياء ولا ولا لأجل أن يسعى وراء الحسيد أو الشكر لأجل أن يشتهر في الجمهور أو أو لأجل الشهرة يعني الكتابة لأجل الشهرة يجب أن يكون سليم القلب سليم النية ولا ولا يريد وراء ذلك جزاء ولا شكرا إلا لأجل لوجه الله يعني نعم ثم بعد ذلك الله الرحمن الرحيم وبعد ذلك إيه نعم وأما بالنسبة لي آه نعم يعني يجب أيضا يجب أن يسعى الكاتب الإبداعي المسلم يسعى لإحياء النفوس يابسة النفوس اليابسة روحيا وعلى سبيل المثال كما قالت المحدثة الأولى أنها قرأت 
بعض الأعمال الأنابية للسوفية للكتاب السوفيين أنهم كتبوا في أبيات شعرية في السوفية وأثر في نفسها تأثيرا أيما تأثير وأما بالنسبة للشباب اليوم فالكتابة الإبداعية علاج فاجع فاجع وشاف لمشكلة شبابنا في عدم قدرتهم على التعبير الصحيح المهذب عن طريق وذلك لا يتم إلا عن طريق القراءة للأعمال الأدبية الإبداعية وهذه وهذا والقراءة لهذه الأعمال من المؤكد أنها ستؤثر إيجابا على شكوى شبابنا على سلوك شبابنا وأيضا يجب توعيد الشباب على قراءة الواسعة الواعية للأعمال الأدبية فالعالم الإسلامي اليوم يعاني من عدم أو من عدم من قلة الاهتمام بالقراءة بين الجيل الجديد القراءة نشاط مصب كلها في الكتب المدرسية وليس هناك قراءة واعية خارج كتب المدرسية فهذه ما يحدث كثيرا في بلدان المسلمة منها في دبي وفي بلدان الأخرى ف وهنا يعني هناك سؤال طرحته المحاضرة حول ما دورنا في نشر الثقافة القراءة بين الشباب وكيف نمضي قدما في إنتاج الأعمال الأبية لنفع مجتمعنا الإسلامي وسبب ذلك ينتقل الحديث إلى المحاضرة الثانية بسور دكتور رحمة ودكتور رحمة متخصصة في الأدب العربي ودكتور رحمة طبعا بدأت في بدأت الحديث عن أهمية التعبير هناك أنواع التعبير هناك الكتابة الرسمية والكتابة الإبداعية على أن الكتابة الرسمية قد تكون على أنماط خاصة وهناك أنواع من الخطابات مثلا تمثل هذا النوع من الكتابة ثم بعد ذلك تترقت إلى الكتابة الإبداعية وهي تعبير عن الأفكار والأحاسيس والرؤية والرؤى والإلهامات وقد تكون في صورة القصص وغيرها وأيضا الكتابة الإبداعية ذكرت أيضا المحاضرة بعض النماذج للكتابة الإبداعية لعلمائنا المسلمين على سبيل المثال الطبري الإمام الطبري فأسهم كثيرا في في تدوين الفلسفة والفلك والأدب والتفسير وله كتاب في التفسير أو في التاريخ مثلا تاريخ الأمم والملوك وأيضا مثال آخر المسعودي وله كتاب مروج الزهب ومعادم الجواهر وإمام الشافعي طبعا فقيه وأديب له رسالة في الأصول الفيق وله وأيضا كتب أخرى وكسرت أيضا في بين بين علمائنا المنزومات المنزومات العلمية وغير العلمية ومنها الجويني في كتابه الورقات ولامية ابن وردي والفية ابن مالك وأيضا المقامات اشتهرت في أدبنا الإسلامي العربي مقامات الحريري ومقامات بديع الزمان الهمداني وأيضا ابن خلدون في مقدمته هو رائد لي أو, أو, أو مسميه واضع لأسس وأصول لعلب الاجتماع المعاصر وأيضا عندنا أيضا في عصرنا الحديث ذكرت المحاضرة بعضا من الرائدين في الأدب الإسلامي المبدعين مثلا علي محمد بكثير ومسرحياته وإسلاما وأيضا نجيب الكلاني دكتور نجيب كلاني وله روايات كثيرة مشهورة رحلة إلى الله وليل وقطبان ورجال رجال الله وغيرها وأيضا الجهاد جهاد إمام الدين الخليل إمام الدين الخليل عديد إسلامي وجهاد الرجابي وختمت المحاضرتنا الثانية محاضرتها حول تعريف الأدب الإسلامي كما رآه نجيب كلاني هو تعبير فني جميل نابع من ذات المؤمن باعث للمنفعة والمتعة ويعبر عن الحياة والكون والإنسان 
وايضا وايضا الكتابه هناك امثله كثيره على الكتابه الابداعيه في العالم الاسلامي وقد جاءت محاضره ببعض النماذج للادب الاسلامي حيث ان الكتاب الابداعيون في المسلم قاموا عن طريق الكتابات الابداعيه قاموا بالدفاع عن الاسلام والتعبير عن الهويه المجتمع الاسلامي في اندونيسيا ف المسلمون قديما وحديثا كانوا مبدعين حقا ولهم اعمال ابداعيه في كل المجالات في اصول الفقه والنحو وغيرها فهناك اهميه بمكان ان نزرع حب القراءه والاطلاع بين شبابنا لان الكتابه لان الذي يكتب لا يستطيع ان يكتب الا اذا قرا كثيرا فالكتابه لا يمكن ممارستها الا من يتقن القراءه فيجب ان نوسع نطاق القراءه حيث لا يمكن ان تكون لاجل الامتحانات فقط او لاجل الكتب في كتب المدارس فقط يجب ان نوسع نطاق القراءه لاجل زرع حب القراءه والاطلاع ومن ثم ان شاء الله نستطيع نشر الكتابة الإبداعية بين شبابنا والله أعلم هذا ما أستطيع أن ألخصها خلال هذه المحاضرتي المحاضرة القيمة شكرا جزيلا أستاذ مزلان تفضل شكرا جزيلا جزاك الله أستاذ ونوصلي for summarizing and recapping some of the points have been made by our two family members ladies and gentlemen we now come to the Q&A session uh, in a few minutes, I will open uh, our uh, session on Google Meet to uh, for you to air your views and your comments about many, some of the things that have been raised by our speakers, Professor Notareda and Professor Rahma. Uh, you could also raise issues that were not mentioned by the two speakers as well. But before that, allow me to uh, recap some of the highlights that I know that I have taken notice with regard to the point that we made by Professor Farida, Notareda and Professor Rahma. I believe there are two kinds of creative writing that we can benefit our young Muslim readers, whether they choose Arabic or English. Uh, for example, Professor Notarida mentioned uh, in, in the Malay writing culture of creative writing, uh, many works have been done with regard to uh, uh, issues about culture, society, religion, through uh, um, you know, uh, Malay fiction, for example. Uh, Shannon Ahmad name comes to the forefront, which has, uh, I think has been that has done a nice job in promoting Malay literature with Islamic twist. Of course, on the Indian side, we got Hamka's most famous work, The Singing of Van Der Wick, the Nilami couple Van Der Wick, for example, which also very, very useful, very interesting, uh, whereby he criticized Muslim society with regard to the Minangkaba culture. So what I think that we uh, can gather from this point is that in order to encourage young Muslims all over the world, in America, in Canada, in Malaysia, in the Middle East, and so on and so on, they are very thirsty for a Muslim, uh, you know, uh, for the Muslim-centric worldview. Now, I think that as instructors, educators, and, and teachers of creative writing and academic nature, perhaps it is our duty to highlight to our young learners, young Muslim learners, about two types of creative writing output. One is fiction outright. Right, fiction writing, novels, poetry, short story, even uh, you know, uh, uh, movies and cinematic features. Recently, you may remember uh, the, in Hollywood they give uh, they produced a movie called Dune uh, by that famous uh, American science science fiction writer Frank Herbert. Frank Herbert uh, was a convert from Christianity to uh, to Zen Buddhism. He was a Buddhist until he passed. But even as a Buddhist, he was a great admirer of Islamic culture. And as a result, many of his novels in Dune about science fiction, about mankind in thousands of years in the future, he used elements of the Islamic culture. In fact, he mentioned directly in uh, many of the interviews, he mentioned Ibn Khaldun, which he credited Ibn Khaldun in teaching the world about how empires and monarchies collapse. Ibn Khaldun talked about the Asabiyah concept, whereby kings and queens can be coupled, not through the power of the military, but also through the power of self-identification. In other words, when a people recognize their true power, 
right? This could topple the, the mightiest of rulers. And I think that interested Frank Herbert in writing Dune, the novel, whereby he credited Ibn Khaldun. So my point is this, that in Islamic civilization, when it comes to writing, Ibn Battuta comes to mind, whereby he wrote basically a travelogue. He wrote about his adventure to the Nordic, to the Viking lands, sometimes in what in the 15th century, for example, where he observed many rituals of the Vikings. In, and he wrote in Arabic, describing his journey, true life journey in Arabic, using the narrative style. And I think that I, I would go as far to saying that I do not think many Muslim youth around the world, adult included, have ever read Ibn Abtuta. Ibn, Ibn Battuta travelogue. No doubt he wrote in Arabic, I am sure. Imagine if, uh, if some Muslim speakers or Muslim writers, or not Muslim for that matter, who is able to translate the writings of Ibn Battuta in his travel to the end of the world, right? Whereby he introduces to the Muslim world the culture of these so called savages, the Vikings, and their ritual. And of course, we come to know about just now, Professor uh, Rahmat talked about the many works written by Atabari, where he wrote through a uh, creative narrative, narrative style of writing. It was not, he did not write uh, academic book, he did not write academic book, but he wrote academic book using the narrative style in the literary style of writing, whereby he wrote uh, in Arabic, history of nations and kings, mentioned by Prof. Rahmat. She also mentioned Al Mas'udi, who wrote The Meadows of Gold and Gem Mines. Again, talking about history and culture when he was alive, but adopting the narrative style of writing rather than straight, pure academic writing. And again, this is what not from Farida mentioned that it doesn't have to be fiction outright, it can be academic writing that employs the tropes and style of literature namely narrative style and we are, as we all know that is what fiction does in fact fiction tells a story either through a novel or through a short story using narrative style characters except that people like al masudi ibn battuta al tabari wrote about real life but they adopted very clear cut right a uh, narrative style that employs literary style and I think this is, I think by large, is generally unknown, right, to Muslim adult and Muslim youth. Ronald Reagan, for of all people in the 80s, one of the most beloved US president, mentioned Ibn Khaldun by name, right? Because he enjoyed reading Ibn Khaldun travelogue, talking about the Muqaddimah, talking about how societies fall and rise, how empires fall and rise, how kings and queens and emperors were defeated, not by foreign invaders, but people who were oppressed by, go, by going back to their origin, going back to their, what is strong within them. And as a result of that, uh, from Rama highlighted to us, for example, uh, uh, you know, Haldun came to be recognized as the, modern, as the father of modern sociology, whereby he talked about the rise and fall of empires. And today, I, I think that thanks to the movie Dune, the novel by Frank Herbert, science fiction, when Haldun are mentioned in many of the movie critics, is interesting, right? They mention, for example, how this uh, writer from the Maghreb who wrote, uh, uh, you know, academic treatises, but in a way that is enjoyable, even by non-academic writers, as well as literary writers. And I think this is missing from us. I like to also mention, for example, uh, one of the most interesting writers of contemporary times in English. And I'm sure you all have heard of uh, uh, Leslie Hazelton, who wrote a very emotional book about the biography of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The way that he told, the way that she told the story of Muhammad and how he, uh, uh, you know, living with his most, uh, most interesting wife, Aisha, and how Aisha continued to feel that she was living in the shadow of Khadija, right? And she was writing a biography on our prophet in English, even though she's not a Muslim, in fact, she's a Jew, huh? 
but in the way that she wrote her novel, sorry, her biography of the prophet is very, very entertaining. Almost like reading fiction. But he made it very clear, this is not fiction. This is writing about facts, and she based it on uh, Arabic sources, and she consulted Islamic fuqaha when she was writing her book. She even read the Quran in writing this biography, Leslie Hazelton. Imagine if we employ. So I think that this idea that it must be done by a Muslim, I think is not exactly a healthy trend. For example, in the West, Muslim all over the world are now living, right? And many are writing. I mentioned in my, uh, my, in my, in my intro, I mentioned three names that come to mind who have done tremendous job in promoting Islam and writing. I mentioned Hafsa Faisal, who wrote the most, one of the most popular fantasy novels for young adults called We Hunt the Flame. Her novel, fantasy novel with Islamic characters, and the character is a woman. What very devoted Islam, without mentioning Islam in a single word, but very strong Islamic identity, became a New York Times best-selling novel. And then there was Han Haghazi, American writer living in Egypt, writing in fiction on Islam and Muslim culture, especially youth from Egypt. Then, of course, in Malaysia, we got Hana al kaf a former journalist of the Star, who wrote a novel published by a well-known publisher. She talked about uh, Muslim identity in Malaysia through the, through the perspective of the racial riot in Malaysia. So these are fiction writers who are very devout Muslim, right? But at the same time understood, like Prof. Aridah mentioned, the power of fiction. So that is one type of book that we can introduce. But I also like to suggest that we also work hard to introduce to our young Muslim who can speak Arabic or not to read history, uh, academic books who employ the narrative style name that Prof. Rahmah mentioned, Al-Tabari, Ibn Battuta, Ibn Khaldun, Al-Mas'udi, and so on and so on. And these are just a few names. So I don't think that we are short of materials. I, I, I doubt it very much. It's just that perhaps we as teachers have not done our job in, in finding where those books can be found. And I think perhaps if we do not write, like Prof. Rahmah admit, just like myself, we do not write you know, poetry or, or, or fiction or whatever, at least we can do, we can help by telling our young Muslim, these are books that you can read. But don't expect this writer to be Muslim from the day one. There are many Muslims who are secular, but very sympathetic to the Muslim causes. But of course, there are Muslims who only in, in, only in name only. Of course, the name of Tumai is Monica Ali of, of Great Britain. She's completely rejected Islam altogether. Right? And these, again, these books should be mentioned by us. No doubt this writer has a Muslim name, but she is not sympathetic to Islam. We need to tell our readers about these people as well. And the nature of the youth of Islam today is that they are thirsty for something that talks about them. Of course, we cannot rely on the mainstream media, right? But that to be expected. But I think when it comes to creative writing, and we define just now, uh, just like from, from North Carolina mentioned, is a very loose translation. Anything that employs creativity in writing, in telling facts, can be creative writing. Writing a journal, a feature on uh, Muslim identities can be creative writing. But of course, today, given the nature of our uh, generation of young people living on uh, as a product of digital revolution, they are very excited to watch uh, that, uh, you know, programs on TV or in the cinema where Islam is mentioned. Uh, again, last, last point. A few weeks ago, I caught by accident a, a, a mini-series on Netflix. It's a horror Netflix involving vampires, very popular now in American fiction, American no, mini-series. In that particular mini-series, about seven episodes, they had a prominent Muslim character, right, who named Hassan who is dealing with his son, who is interested in Jesus Christ. They showed him and uh, this character, Hassan and his son, doing the salah together, right? And he's a sheriff, a policeman in the town. And he is interested to go to the church to learn about Jesus Christ from Islam, from the Christian perspective. 
and as you got, there was a conflict. But that conflict resulted in Hassan, the character, talking about that we Muslim do not mind going to a church to listen to your to listen to your terama because we believe in Jesus Christ, except we call him Isa, except that what we are we are disagreeing on the fundamental. So I think that is an effort, even by Hollywood, a small one at that, an effort to try to project a better impression of his of Muslim and Islam. And I think this is something that can be highlighted. You know that it is a visual medium, but can be used as a platform to uh, guide our young Muslim readers to the books, right? Ibn Battuta, travel law, right? History books, the crusade, the, the, the war of the crusade as written by Arabic chroniclers who talk about history, but using the narrative style, not a very boring and esoteric historical book. And that I think, you know, mistaken is what creative writing is about. And but I think we as instructors, I think we are obligated to do this as soon as possible. So now I open the floor uh, for anyone to make a point that has been raised so far. Tafadal Mashkura. The floor is yours. Anyone? We have still a good crowd. 74 people still online. <laughs> Uh, that's a good number. It started with about 90s, now it's gone to number 74. So they are still waiting out there, so they are interested. So we better ask something interesting now. <laughs> Again, while waiting, if, if you are very keen, you might want to watch, read the novel and watch the movie called Dune. It's very interesting. Very few, very no scenes of extreme violence or nudity, whatever. Right? Even that horror movie called Mass, Ma Midnight Mass is very almost g-rated with no with no nudity or extreme violence but it has a surprisingly positive characterization of muslim figure in a prominent role which is very very rare in hollywood nowadays anyone assalamu alaikum yes dr Wan uh, uh, yes Muslim, uh, actually i want to uh, Dr. Rahma, Pro Rahma, yeah, I think Dr. Pro Rahma is really very close to education ministry, our education ministry, and I have something to ask about our um, our school, our, our our book at school. Actually, we have in English. Actually, we have uh, Arabic uh, English component for literacy for uh, uh, literary book. Apa itu mengaitu sastra apa nama? Komponen sastra for English and for Malay. Uh, language, but we don't have for Arabic language. That's that, that that's the thing that lacking of our um, Arabic curriculum, curriculum in uh, our 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 school. We don't have um, syllabus for literary for literature. Actually. That's why we are focusing on nothing grammar, sorrow, you know, everything, but not in lit literature. That's why our our language actually not very very not very uh, not very good actually from on, on our school because they not actually not introduced to literature at the late stage of the school uh, school of uh, school time i think that's the our problem in rabbit language we have in every language so many books to be literature book but our students cannot read because they not introduced to the liter literature at the early stage what are your opinion uh, about that uh, I, I totally agree uh, with you, Dr. Wan Rosli. Um, and uh, cur currently, um, I'm uh, leading a IEM flagship uh, Rahma project, which focuses uh, one of the sub projects is to um, empower, uh, uplift, upskill uh, those teaching uh, Islamic studies, including uh, Arabic, and also the students. And we are going down uh, to the schools, uh, and they were complaining. Like, uh, I, but I was, was rather surprised when I looked at the the textbook that I used um, uh, in 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 the Islamic schools. It is it's actually I, I found in Al Qais there, Nabir Dubiani's poem is there, and, and a number of other uh, literary figures with with the Nas. Uh, and the Sharah and the, the Balagha, 
uh, but they are having problems to, to attract students uh, to to study and and, and uh, because the passing rate of students in in, in these courses it is very bad. Um, but I'm I'm not sure. I have not looked at the textbooks used uh, at uh, uh, in, in in schools as as a compulsory course. Uh, we, 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 all of us went through the system. Uh, Pendidikan Islam. In, in our book, Pendidikan Islam, before we had a Quran, we had Hadith, and Arabic was just as the concentrating on uh, the 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 Nahwa and Sarf, and, and there were not no story, but I'm not sure now. Uh, so I, I think, and when I approached the uh, someone is uh, uh, Haskula Sabu is saying S A B K school. Uh, um, maybe you can comment on, on that later, Hasbuma. But, but I, I think uh, when, uh, we, we maybe under this uh, uh, University for Society, uh, we can approach uh, the matter uh, with, with uh, providing solutions. Um, and, and the method of uh, used to teach is also in need, in critical need of, of, of change. Uh, the, the young generation are, are so, like Prof. Noor Farida was saying, they are so uh, engrossed in this uh, uh, gadget that they, when you talk to them directly, they cannot grasp anything. It's like talking to uh, zombies. Um, but uh, you need to, um, so we need to improve, maybe int start introducing for, for those books, the, the Turas, the, the classical books, which are of beneficial to, to the students uh, with the concept of uh, flip, uh, flip books, flip comics and, and audio, because uh, these, these young generation are more visual, uh, but at the same time, if you have someone that reads nicely and they can read for them the news the, the the story then that would may be able to encourage uh, uh, and 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 the 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 interest in, in that um uh, brother mazlan there is someone by the name of hasbullah sabu uh, yeah in the audience he had something to add just now okay go ahead you can text me you can you can you know, voice your opinions on uh, you know on air it's up to you and I'm, I'm reading the uh, the sms the short messages nothing for him so far if you have, a, if you have a, something to say but i think that if while while waiting that rama mentions now that we are dealing with a very visual generation the nations who are very very keen on the visual first reading later i think this uh, i would call it the mobilization of our generation Young people who enjoy watching superhero super, superhero movies and reading comic books and seem to be interpreting real life from a very false uh, text. You know, in terms of to them that is reality, and I think this is not unique to the Muslim. Even American mm -hmm. philosophers and psychologists are also concerned as well because the, the as the direct result of the advance of technology in movie making combined with uh, reading of literature low in quality, like comic books, for example, like Marvel and DC. I think that the combination of the visual and the text, I think has in a way affected the mindset of American youth. Their sense of morality, the sense of right and wrong, and even now it's like reality is become very, very warped. So I think it's, it's not something that is unique to us Muslims. But I think in terms of for the Muslim youth, there is an opportunity for Muslim creative writers on all medium, fiction, literature, movie making, to talk about Muslim history, for example. If young people around the world enjoy pirate movies, there are many good examples of pirate characters uh, in the Muslim uh, history, for example, yes, who, who, who were dealing with issue about piracy and whatnot in a way that is different from Western concepts of piracy, you know, uh, you know, the concept of, uh, you know, fantasy that is, that can be found in 
uh, the Arabian tales of Once in One Night and so on. It, th those are things that can be used as a starting point to create visual texts that young Muslim can relate to when they say, mm -hmm. ah, finally, a, a visual uh, product that speaks my culture. It, it could be in English or in Arabic or even Malay, it doesn't matter, but it, it can be done. And I think that it's a matter of time before we can find someone who do this. But we, in the academic side, we need to dig up on our literary history in Arabic, mm -hmm. in English, and in Malay, and any other languages for that matter, to highlight creative writing can be either talking about real life, or it can be a fiction based on real life. Just what the West has done for so long and doing it very, very well. Yeah? Okay, Brother Abdul Hamid, Tafadal, bro, uh, Brother, Tafadal. You can, you, you can... Assalamu alaikum, can you hear me? Am I clear? Alhamdulillah. Okay, Alhamdulillah, thank you. Uh, I was uh, proposing that our uh, uh, Islamic Literature League here in Malaysia uh, play this big role in introducing uh, the Islamic literature in Arabic, English, and Malay. We mm -hmm. are lucky to have uh, like Prof. Rahma, who is, mashallah, yani, <laughs> uh, well versed in, in, in Arabic, English, Malay, as well as uh, some of our great stars like Dr. Abdurrahman Sheikh. Uh, Dr. Wan, maybe uh, for my case, only in, in, in English and Arabic. <laughs> I don't know Malay. Uh, maybe like you, only uh, Malay and English, same as uh, Prof. Uh, Farida. But if, if you are good in Malay, Arabic, and English, and I think this is what, what, what makes uh, uh, our uh, league in Malaysia so unique in the uh, Western society, they are good in English, perhaps. In addition to that, maybe some other uh, European languages in the Middle East, in the Arab world, they are good in Arabic only. But here in Malaysia, especially in UIA, in, in, in our Islamic literature league in Malaysia, we have uh, these three languages. So why not we take the initiative to, to translate or to introduce uh, some values and virtues that are, are, are not yet uh, exposed or, or known to the to society? Uh, so I propose we, we, we take some projects or some initiatives uh, because this, this league is so unique. So until now, people even inside Malaysia, they don't know about it. We are not yet to expose our, <laughs> our talent, our, our uh, what you call knowledge and wisdom. We mm. are good in three big languages in the, in the Muslim world. So why not we, we, we do something? Uh, I'm saying this because uh, now you see the attendance for tonight. Uh, in the beginning, it was more than uh, 98, 98 people attended. It's yeah. a huge crowd. Because it people are, 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 are eager to, to listen to us. <laughs> people are eager to, to know Islamic literature in English, Malay, Arabic. So within UIA, we are not yet uh, known to, to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, inside Malaysia, we are not yet known. So the, the league, when it started a uh, few years back, the idea was to have branches in Brunei, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, Philippines, and so on and so forth. So people know about uh, our culture, about our literature. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think uh, the way uh, uh, that we we supposed to uh, to take some initiatives. I mean, we, we have so many ways how to, how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, until now, not yet done what we supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So maybe now tonight we had, mashallah, uh, Prof. Farida, our former deputy director, Prof. Rahma, former deputy director, and Ustaz Abdurrahman Sheikh, our president, who is known, well known in, in Southeast Asia for his da'wah movement, for his uh, uh, Arabic grammar uh, lessons. Uh, so we, inshallah, we can do a lot. We can do a lot. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my proposal is that uh, let us uh, expand our, our work. Let us uh, have something that is so unique that never happened before. Uh, an Islamic literature in three languages, in one yeah. book. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Can, can I respond to that, yeah. Brother no, 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 Professor. Uh, actually, I was talking to Dr. Noh on this, uh, the need for a translation center at IUM under our kuliah. And he said that there was actually a project already 
done by I think Arabic department or initiated by Arabic department in which they translated children's story. But that project has been taken by IIUM Press. So we don't know what happens to that now. So I think the job now is to make sure that the project really take off. Mm. You know, if it doesn't happen, then I suggest uh, Department of Arabic Language and Literature to take back that project mm. and you spearhead it. We mm. are happy to help. Mm. You know, we are happy to help with the translation of mm. Malay and English. Mm. Uh, but I think it's a good idea because there is a demand for Islamic oriented children's uh, stories. There's a lack of that. So let IIUM spearhead this, you know, and we fill in that gap. The project is there, but tak tak dengar cerita because IIUM press took over. Thank you. Yes, for Rahma, for Dr. Excellent idea, um, Prof. Nafari. And uh, the the point uh, is well taken. Uh, made by Dr. Abdul Hamid Muhammad. Uh, I, I, I totally agree, but we are still uh, in UIA uh, working in silos. Uh, we have uh, the course Practical Translation. Uh, and we have uh, final year projects. We have um, research papers. We have uh, uh, final uh, final uh, what papers written for almost all the courses, uh, and, but the, uh, and and we are uh, English department is working by themselves. The Arabic department is working them by themselves, and Rabita is an entity by itself. So if we work together, and uh, we we make it. Uh, semi-compulsory for all our students um, uh, in the Arabic department and in the English department to be members of the Rabita Adabil Islami uh, and they have a role so we, we, we provide projects okay we provide projects just like uh, uh, the, the Jamal Layl Kursi um, we, we try to solicit funds and we we identify projects that are need projects that are needed by the ummah currently and we uh, uh we we, we um, and and so we, we encourage students to uh, this is uh, real life projects uh problem-based projects and it's not theoretical thank you for rahma right brothers and sisters professors uh students former students and the public. Um, I think we have come to the end of our session. It is now almost 11 p.m. Uh, I think that we had just started to scratch the surface with regard to the importance of creative writing. Uh, thanks to the input from Professor Nur Farida and Professor Rahma, I think to their various uh, points that they have made earlier, I think that uh, this is perhaps a, an opportunity to uh, facilitate a far more effective uh, method of conveying uh, the Islamic, uh, uh, you know, disposition, the Islamic perspective on the world via creative writing. And I think throughout for the past one and a half hours, what we have, what have been, what has transpired so far is that creative writing doesn't have to be in pure fiction alone. It can be done in academic and it's been done before. Classical writers in the Islamic world have demonstrated that very well. For example, through chron uh, chronicles and travelogues on historical events, on adventure, on da'i, on da'wah work and things like that. In the contemporary times, there have been many examples of uh, Muslim uh, perspective on the world. I, I, I mentioned this, uh, for example, two places come to mind. One in Malaysia, whereby there is a very, I think, a very encouraging signs of the, in the world of animation, whereby the Muslim perspective of night, right, has been put forward through various animated features and has made 
tremendous impact on everyone, including Muslim and non-Muslim alike. On the Turkey side, uh, again on Netflix, for example, creative writing at its highest and its visual form, the, 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 the 11 episode long of the history of Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, right, on Netflix, talking about from episode 1 to episode 11, how Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, for example, conquered Constantinople using the Hollywood format of telling a story, using Turkish actors, Turkish dialogue, the costumings were perfect, the special effects were excellent. And I think these are the medium that com combining text and the visual arts, I think, has long been ignored by us. And I think that on our part in the university, it is rather embarrassing for us to tell the world that we have an, an excellent school in Arabic, on Saludin, on economics, on business study, and even law. But we don't even have uh, the faculty or, or, or a unit on creative arts. We don't have that. And I think it's, it's a real shame. And, and I think that we need to at least work toward this get some people who have the expertise, even the money to do this. Because right now, there is a great hunger by Muslim youth. And they, I think by like we do not give them enough credit. Muslim youth know what they are now being fed by Hollywood, by Netflix, by stories by, you know, on Harry Potter, are just pure nonsense. It has no redeeming value. And they know that. But at the same time, they also are saying, what is that alternative for me? There is no alternative. And I think this is where perhaps uh, the, the cry or the hunger of the youth or the Muslim youth, right? I think we can tap into. Because I think in terms of uh, the possible uh, uh, resources have already available. Some are as low as, uh, as old as 600 years. Some are very, very current. I think we need to tap into that. Our job, like I said earlier, we need to find them right either in published form visual form and highlight to our muslim youth these are potential sources where muslim worldview are at the center and i think we need at least we can do that maybe we struggle to write our story of our own but we can capitalize on other people's work i think on that note with the mission of dr rahman uh, i think we can we can call our session to come to an end right i think it's been very very interesting because like Dr. Uh, Muhammad, Abdul Hamid said just now, the crowd was quite positive. The number in terms of people that turned up initially was quite high, but in the 90s, now about 66. That means they are still interested. Perhaps Dr. Rahman Chi can organize another seminar or forum on such a topic, a topic that I think by default is automatically something that everybody desires, young and old. And on that note, Right, I, uh, we conclude our session for tonight. Alhamdulillah, may Allah reward for all our efforts. Uh, we may not be able to see the result in our lifetime, but at least we can tell uh, our maker in the hereafter, we are do, we try to do something about it. And on that note, uh, I'll bid you a good night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shukran. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.